Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the All Me Podcast, everyone. I'm Brian Parker, spending time with you today as your host. I'm here to continue our series with one of our tremendous partners, the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, which we all refer to as PBSCCS. As we have discussed, PBSCCS is our partner behind our Major League Baseball All Me Advisory Board, which is composed of players from across the league, inspiring people to achieve their physical goals the right way. This is why we're teaming up and bringing you a series of podcast episodes focusing on a variety of different performance topics. In this episode, we talk with Logan Jones, a minor league performance coach for the Chicago White Sox. Logan and I kick things off by talking about his background, specifically within the world of baseball as he played at the collegiate level, and then we dive into talking about his topic, which is mobility training. We talk to Logan about what mobility means to him, the importance of training in this area, the difference between mobility and flexibility, and how mobility changes as we change. We also discuss the other keys that have to be in place alongside your training, exercises you could do at home to improve your own mobility, and his thoughts about those that might be tempted by PEDs to achieve that goal. Logan and I connect about our home of North Carolina, and he also offers his own contact info and social media content to help you with your own mobility training. Thanks to PBS CCS for their support and to Logan for this discussion, which we will get into right now. What's up, Logan? Welcome to the show. Yeah. How are you? Hey, Brian, I'm doing well, man. Thanks so much for having me on this morning. I'm looking forward to it. You know, you and I were chatting just for a couple of seconds before we even got started, and I think this is going to be a pretty fun conversation, not only because of your topic, but I've learned that we uh, both live in North Carolina. We went to school about 20 minutes from each other, so we're, all, we're already long lost friends before we even started this conversation. So I'm looking forward to not only having a little bit of fun, but getting some good information out there, and we appreciate your time on, on giving us some background on your topic, which we'll dive into here in a second, but... As our listeners already know, because we're into the series a little bit, we, we put together a series with PBS CCS, and we're interviewing strength coaches from across the league on a variety of different topics. And we'll get into your topic here in just a minute. But I'm going to start every one of these chats that I'm doing, getting to know the person I'm talking to a little bit. I think that's always a good place to start with the podcast. So that's what I'm going to ask you to, to give us some background on first. So tell us a little bit about the early days of Logan, which is a very broad question, but anything you think that would apply to what we're doing here, right? So where you're from, what your interests were early on, probably makes sense to tell us a bit about your baseball baseball background. I know you've been in that sport for a while. So anything you want us to know about you from the start, it's probably a good place for us to get rolling. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Logan Jones. I'm from Zebulon, North Carolina, about 30 minutes east of Raleigh. Uh, this is my sixth year in professional baseball. First with the Chicago White Sox. I spent the previous five with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Did my undergraduate at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I also uh, played on the baseball team. Following my time in Greensboro, I completed a couple of collegiate internships, one at the University of Kentucky, another at Wake Forest University, working with a variety of sports. Uh, that, that time in my life was super instrumental in kind of guiding and directing me in what direction I wanted to go. And it was really my first experience working with a team out on the floor in a coaching environment. It was also my first experience uh, outside of being an athlete as well. So we talked on uh, the early days of Logan. Like I, I grew up playing baseball and, and many different sports, but uh, I kind of always had my eye on baseball and was kind of the passion of mine really for as long as I could remember and fortunate to grow up in a, in a baseball family, a family that valued the importance of working as part of a team and, and sharing their responsibility and giving credit um, and, and really relying on one another. And my parents were super in instrumental in instilling some of those qualities in me at a very young age that I've carried with me uh, to this day. So got done at, at, at Kentucky, went on to Wake Forest, which was nice because I was able to come back a little closer to home. Uh, but I was about halfway through with that internship at, in Winston-Salem and uh, an opportunity came about with the Diamondbacks and and uh, involved, obviously, moving out to Arizona, and it was something that was definitely uncharted waters, unfamiliar territory. It was a little uncomfortable, uh, but I knew that if I wanted to remain in baseball after my playing days, that this was kind of 
you know, where I needed to go and what I needed to do. So uh, I took a leap of faith there and, and joining the Diamondbacks and spending five seasons there, probably the best decision that, that I've made uh, professionally, um, just from a strength and conditioning standpoint, but then also from a personal and professional growth uh, development standpoint. And like I, like I just mentioned, it's my first season with the Chicago White Sox. I've been here since November and, and uh, I can't speak highly enough about our sports medicine performance team with the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, all that path makes sense. Uh, I knew about your background in baseball a little bit, so I, I assumed that that's kind of one of the reasons you were staying in that sport because you had a passion for it. Uh, and I'm also curious about, now that you're on the performance and the strength and conditioning side, when did that interest get into the mix? Like, I mean, what were you even studying at Guilford? Was it exercise sports science? Were you already thinking about this as a potential path? When did that side of things start to mesh with the baseball side of things? And you thought, okay, I'm going to go into that kind of niche and part of the sport if that makes sense yeah it's a good question i i was a double major at guilford uh, exercise and sports science and health science uh kind of chose that route early on because i knew that it was general in nature and kind of broad and it would allow me to explore and kind of determine what i wanted to do as i moved throughout school i'd started I feel like pretty pretty similar to what what many others do, where I was kind of like uh, athletic training, physical therapy, strength conditioning, not really sure. Um, and I would say that it kind of became a little more clear as I was uh, going into the fall of my senior season. Um, I obviously knew that uh, you know, barring something unforeseen happening, like I was I was wrapping up on my playing career and. And, and had an enjoyable experience playing baseball in college. And it kind of encouraged me to, to stay in the game. As I mentioned, that was kind of always something that I dreamed of doing was being in baseball for a career. And, and obviously I didn't, wasn't exactly sure what that was going to look like. Um, but it was, that's kind of what drove me in the direction of strength and conditioning was uh, having people and, and through conversation at, at, and my exposure at Guilford of really helping to guide me based on what it is that I was saying I wanted to do and which direction I needed to go. And uh, there was an, a gentleman uh, who was a strength and conditioning intern at Kentucky uh, that had graduated from Guilford a couple of years before myself and, and uh, talked with him on the phone. I actually went and, and sat down and got some lunch with him one day. And, and uh, he was able to help me get my foot in the door at Kentucky uh, in their Olympic sports strength and conditioning uh, department and and like I mentioned, that was kind of my first exposure to being in a team environment, like a, in, in more of a, a coaching role. Um, and then from there, I, I loved you know everything that we were doing and and was kind of all ears and learned a, a great amount in just a short period of time of eight to ten weeks uh, summer unpaid summer internship at Kentucky and. And then uh, it, things got a little clearer for me as I made the move to Wake Forest and was working a lot with baseball here at Wake and and uh, was able to also, you know, have some some a hand in a lot of other areas and with a, with other, other teams as well. Um, but then, like I mentioned, the job with the Diamondbacks became available and, and things just kind of worked out there. So I, I would say that um, just through immersion and, and having some conversation and, and fortunate enough to have some mentors and some people that had been where I was looking to go um, kind of helped me along and it helped help establish that route for me um, moving into my senior year at Guilford. Yeah, I think there's some good kind of life lessons in that story too, right? Because I mean, for a couple of different ways, right? Like I, I, I run into a lot of athletes that you know, are in the sport and that's kind of their life's passion and that's a lot of their time. And then, as you said, when that kind of comes to an end, they're not quite sure what steps to take next. And you're a good example of like, look, there are ways to stay adjacent to that sport, stay in the sport, even if you're not playing it. I think that's kind of cool. And you are also a, a good life story of sometimes it's who you run into and who will help you out and who will show you some stuff and guide you down some paths. I mean, that's part of what life is too. So you stay open to those kind of things. It reminds me not really too much like my story but same way like i grew up as an athlete like you know i can promise you you were a better athlete than me but i played sports all through <laughs> high school didn't know what i wanted to do when i went to college and i'm like okay i'll study sports management that'll keep you know i have an interest there it'll keep me kind of adjacent to it and then i graduate i still don't know what to do so i'm like i'll work in minor league baseball i'll stay adjacent there and it takes me to the job that i'm doing now was you know not was fully expected but i'm still kind of adjacent to some of my interests right so you stay open you know, you stay interested in some things. You never know where, where life will take you. And it's taken you right up to being the minor league performance coach for the White Sox. And so that's what I want to talk about next. Before we dive into your topic, which we're going to get to in a second, 
tell us a little bit about your current role. Like, what are you doing with the White Sox? And probably the easiest way to ask that question, what does an average day look like for you? I know it's different all the time, but what are your main responsibilities? Yeah, no, that's a good one. In my current responsibility, the Diamondbacks, I work in player development, which is the minor league system, our feeder system that that obviously feeds our big league team in Chicago. And uh, you're right, it does look like it looks a little different depending on the time of the year, kind of what we have going on. Um, we'll we'll start at the beginning of spring training. So the beginning of spring training, our entire system, major league, minor league, player development, everyone shifts out to Arizona, Glendale, Arizona, where our spring training facility is, and. Um, those days are super chaotic. We have everyone in one spot, all of the staff, all of our players, all of the support staff, front office. I mean, the whole nine yards, everyone's out there. We're kind of, you know, there's, there's a, many different, uh, processes and, and interventions and different things going on at, at the same time. Um, on many different backfields, we have a stadium field. We have a couple of different batting cages, some bullpen mounds, et cetera. Um, so our, our days are pretty long uh, during spring training. We're, we're talking early morning to late evening, a lot of exposure, uh, a lot of conversation with players and staff alike. Uh, and then as we transition into in season, our, obviously our major league team is in Chicago. We have four uh, minor league affiliate teams, one in, in Charlotte, one in Birmingham, one in Winston-Salem, and one in Kannapolis. And then we also have a complex team uh, out in Arizona. So we have a strength coach that's stationed at each one of those locations. And then on, from a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the performance coach is responsible for think all things uh, physical. So we're talking strength and conditioning. We're talking speed and agility. We're talking mobility training. We're talking some skill acquisition, skill development type stuff. we we'll also have a hand in a lot of the nutritional um, uh, guidance and oversight at an affiliate as we have uh roving uh d sport dietitians but we don't have a, a full-time dietitian station to each one of our our player development minor league affiliates mm -hmm. so we also have a larger hand in some of that conversation and the and, and education surrounding the importance of you know hydration and nutrition and, and sleep and such so when you think minor league performance coach you can think strength and conditioning but obviously it goes a little bit uh a little bit past your your standard uh job responsibility maybe of a strength and conditioning coach which is which is what we would call performance um so it's it's all it's multifactorial and it's it, it is difficult to kind of like wrap your head around at times because i think in, in some instances we're being pulled in various directions um however we're fortunate to have the resources available to be able to have influence in many different areas um in in, in the development processes of, of our athletes in hopes of obviously developing them into major league baseball players that are sustainable and helping our major league team win a world series. Yeah, you did a good job summing it up. I know that question is not usually the fairest one that I'll ask because uh, a day to day is gonna be different day to day and there's so much different things on your plate. Like you just mentioned, there's way more aspects to performance than the average person might think. So there's a lot that goes into what you do. Uh, and so knowing that, I mean look, there was a lot of different topics that you and I could be talking about today and now now that we've kind of got some background and set the table you know we, we want to dive into the topic that you sent over that you wanted to focus on so in this series we're asking each of you to really to pick one topic because as you just said like if we talk about performance as a whole that could go in a million different directions so we're going to narrow it down a little bit with you and and what the topic you want to focus on you know today is mobility training now before i dive into what that means what that looks like what entails mobility let's start out of my curiosity why was this a topic that you wanted to discuss why was this what came to mind you know when we asked you for a specific idea yeah that's a good question i think j just just in general i think when people think physical well-being and physical you know we'll call it health and performance like that mobility isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind generally we're thinking about weightlifting. we're thinking about conditioning we're thinking about ways that we can develop and sustain strength we're talking injury management techniques and, and and sometimes i feel like mobility training kind of falls by the wayside um it's kind of like a place filler it's something that um, we default to when we're not sure <laughs> maybe what else to do or we just put it on a on a sunday recovery day because what else are we going to do besides you know hit some some passive like range of motion type stuff sit on the ground and have a feel good on uh, on Sunday morning before our day game, <laughs> so I, right. I think uh, with with that kind of that like coming from that place, I thought it would be something interesting to discuss because I think that it is that it is important and it is a, a, an integral piece of the puzzle, if you will, to 
optimizing both health and performance. Um, because I, I obviously we have to be very cognizant of both. Um, we're obviously trying to raise the bar and push performance as, as much as we can. However, we have to uh, stay in tune with uh, ways that we can, that, you know, that we can manage from a health standpoint as well, and make sure that our guys are they're they're available and that they're ready to go uh, each and every night at seven o'clock. Because obviously, you know, it, we're we're limited if if uh, if the roster that is constructed at each one of our player development affiliates or very importantly, at the big league level, if, if you know if guys are on the shelf and not able to perform uh, the greatest extent, then and do that on a on a, on an everyday repeatable basis, then all of a sudden, uh, I would argue that we're not doing our job and making sure that uh, that these guys are ready to go each night. So that's kind of why it piqued my interest was because I feel like that it's not something that's maybe all that like there's there's not a high degree of exposure, and I think that sometimes it just kind of falls by the wayside. So I'd like to maybe bring some awareness and discuss some of the you know, the ins and outs of mobility training today. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it's just something that probably doesn't get ignored or doesn't become a priority as much as it should. Right. Or maybe, you know, I'm going to guess it might even be something that's not fully understood. Right. Some people might just hear the word mobility and just think moving, they might, you know, make it pretty simplistic, which I'm going to guess that, you know, mobility training is something that's probably pretty nuanced. Right. So let's look at the word first. Like when you say mobility, when you hear that, what does that word really mean to you? Like, what are we talking about and how does that apply to athletics? What's the kind of definition in your mind on mobility as a whole? Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, well, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of mobility, I, I take it a step back and I think posture and position. So I, we're talking just structure, how someone shows up uh, physically, visually, when we're looking at them, like, a, you know, Where's their head? Where's their, their head and their neck? Where's their pelvis? Where's their rib cage? Kind of how to, you know, because everyone kind of presents differently. And that posture and that position can kind of give us some insight and indication of how that individual could move or how they will likely move or maybe what are some of their biases of their movement. So I think, I think when we're dis- discussing mobility training, it's definitely going to be in like a more of an individualized approach. We talk about individualizing training all the time and we do different things and and efforts to try to individualize. But I I really do feel like that if we're prescribing any kind of intervention, whether it be strength training, mobility training, speed, agility, whatever it is, I do feel like that we have to make an effort to meet each individual where they are to make sure that we're dosing them with what's appropriate, what they need. Uh, So and mobility is no different in my mind. So I'm, I'm taking a step back. I'm thinking posture, position, um, because certainly that posture and position is going to dictate maybe some of their function and, and how it gives us some insight as to how they're going to move. Um, but I but I really think mobility more or less is aligning that structure that I've been talking on to increase and improve like our bandwidth to be able to 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 stay healthy and to optimize performance. So it's basically, you know, creating an increase in our ability to do that, but then it's also just improving the quality of what we already have. So okay. it's the whole, it's the whole like, hey, do we just go out there and stretch, and then we stand up, and then we go out there and play, or are we doing different things where we can basically access the range of motion that we currently have, strengthen those ranges of motion, and then only in, increase or decrease ranges when appropriate based on the given task. In our case, in working in baseball, it's the demand of playing the sport of baseball at a very high level on a daily basis, and what kind of what goes into that. Yeah, taking something that uh, might be simple or might be overthought, right? Like, the, just like you said, like just stretching, might people think that, well, that's all mobility training is, right? But no, there's a lot more to it. Here's what's involved. Even stuff like posture, you said that it made me stand up, sit up kind of straight, just thinking about stuff like that, right? So there's a few different things that go into it. I'm going to, I'm going to assume because I want to keep, you know, developing my, my, my own understanding of mobility and the kind of stuff that you're working on with your athletes, right? So, because when I hear that word, there's a couple other words that I kind of think of that may, may, maybe they're related, maybe they're not. I want you to kind of help me out, right? There's a couple of things I had kind of thought of and sent over. Like when I hear mobility, does this lead to things like flexibility? Does it lead to things like speed? Are these things related? Do I need to work on mobility first to then improve my flexibility and my speed? Are all of these things different? Like how, how much of this is tying in? Is mobility the starting point for a lot of different things? I don't know how much I'm making sense there, but how much do just those kind of two words even tie together to mobility in the first place? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think it's, it's tough because I I feel like mobility is contextual and it's fluid. So meaning we change daily, 
uh, like within ourselves, we change daily. So our, our ranges of motion, both passive and active change on a daily basis. Some of our, how we show up daily changes. And then certainly individual to individual, it's going to show up to a great degree, much differently than it would, you know, within ourselves. So I, I think that, uh, to answer your question, all of these things are related and they're all important. Um, so it kind of highlights the importance of a, like a holistic model that takes into consideration um, these different variables when we're establishing plans of attack for whether it be just uh, someone who is healthy and we're trying to keep them in a the good spot and optimize performance, or if it's more of a return to play type scenario where all of a sudden we're taking someone who may you know be dealing with a, a four to six week, um, let's take a hamstring return to play, for example, and now all of a sudden we're trying to get them in a, a better position to be able to uh, fire the hamstrings and restore hip extension, for example, to make sure that we're not putting them in a disadvantaged position to be able to go out and perform. Um, so I think that all of these things are super related. And, and unfortunately, that probably means that the answer is not black and white. Um, but I would say that nine times out of 10, it, 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 as often as we can implement uh, mobility work as part of a, a good uh, movement prep, warm up session, generally speaking, assuming we're doing smart things and putting them in a position that they need to be to, to match the demand of what's asked of them out on the field. Yes. Mo movement and mobility training should be implemented uh, prior to most performance type environments or before something that we do because we're, a we're actively putting them in a better position um, from a posture and positional standpoint to allow the muscles that are attached to bone to be able to contract and relax more efficiently to optimize and to achieve an outcome. So an example would be uh, baseball, we play a rotational sport, the obliques, internal, external obliques, for example, it's super important musculature in the core region for a baseball player. So if we're doing some things that we can put uh, the, the ribs actively stacked on top of the pelvis from a link tension relationship, we're, we're implementing different exercises and drills to, to put from a postural standpoint, to put these structures on top of one another. And then we mobilize from that position now we're putting the individual in a good spot, a healthy spot to be able to go out there and not only stay healthy from a posture and position standpoint, but then also from a performance standpoint, now we're in a position where we can create a repeatable delivery. To take a picture, for example, we can create a repeatable de delivery over and over again to achieve a desired outcome that we may be asking them to do. That makes sense. I mean, kind of what I'm pulling out when I'm trying to, you know, simplify it in my head a little bit is get, it's like range of motion feels like a really key phrase that ties into a lot of what you're saying, right? Like there's things that I can do to improve that outcome and improve range of motion, which can mean a few different different places in your body and a few different outcomes. Right. But that's really what we're working towards. And that's what I was going to ask you next is for examples of like how this can work, like how, how can strength training improve mobility? You just gave us one. Would another example be like, because I know we talked about this, but like is stretching an example of mobility training or is that something that's completely different or is that just like a, one simplistic way that we can improve mobility, but there's got to be more on top of that? Like what's another example like using stretching, I guess, as a starting point, like is that example of how I can do this. I can do stretching, which is a form of mobility training, and that will lead to X outcome on the field, or does it have to be more to it than that? Yeah, I would definitely say that, that stretching is a form of mobility. It's one of our, it's one of our plays when we think of mobility. I, when I think of, when I think of stretching, I'm thinking more of flexibility, which is in my mind, I'm thinking like elasticity of, of musculature, okay. generally speaking, like when we're stretching the quads, we're stretching the hamstrings, we're generally speaking, more often than not, stretching some type of targeted musculature that we want to to achieve an outcome. So flexibility and stretching may be a, a means towards us achieving our goal of increased mobility. When I think of mobility, I'm thinking you talked about ranges of motion. I'm thinking usable ranges of motion to, a, to achieve a desired outcome. So if we say, hey, our pitcher needs 10 to 15 degrees of uh, shoulder internal rotation, whatever they they have a lot of external rotation, but they but we're lacking internal rotation. The total arc there is less than desirable. Say we say we determine that they need a little bit of, of of internal rotation at the shoulder. Then we may go and do some stretching of some of the external rotators, for example, some down regulation of those uh, muscle groups, and then we might activate or we might try to upregulate some of the internal rotators 
or we put them in a position that's more advantageous to be able to internally rotate at the shoulder. And now all of a sudden we've utilized some of our flexibility training, some of our standard uh, traditional stretching techniques towards our outcome of trying to create an increased range of motion from a mobility standpoint at the shoulder. So I, I would say that it's, I would say that they're highly interrelated. However, I would, I would argue that they're not the same. Okay. Flexibility to me is more flexibility to me is more of the elasticity of musculature, whereas mobility is, is more of a usable range of motion to achieve whatever desired outcome um, that we have in mind in this particular case of helping our baseball player for that need. And I think that's good to know because I do think there'll probably be some people that tune in just initially, see the topic and think, oh, cool, this is more about stretching. I can learn techniques that I can do to, you know, get me warmed up or might it be. And I want to, I do want to get that information out there and know the difference. And so there's people can also know that there's multiple things to work on, right? That we're not just talking about that as a warm up, that there's a, there's a lot more to it. And I'm also kind of curious you know, knowing a bit more about now what kind of training we're talking about and what kind of outcomes you're working towards through this kind of training, how long can this kind of take? And I'm, this is probably a question that's going to vary very differently depending on what goal and the person that we're working with, right? But let me let me just use the example that you just said. If it's a pitcher that needs, you know, 15 degrees of internal rotation difference, right? How long are you going to have to work with that person through your program, through your performance and mobility training to get them to the outcome that they need? Is this going to be completely dependent on the goal and the person? Or is there general out like, hey, X amount of time usually with mobility training can lead to this level of outcome? Yeah, it, it is case dependent. And I, I'd say that generally speaking, we need to proceed with caution, um, especially like I'm obviously my bias is, you know, working in professional baseball. Like I feel like I have a decent idea at this point of as to things that that work that have worked well for me to this point, working in this environment, maybe some things that, that don't work as well. And, and some things that I've made steer away from, or some things that I would encourage. And I, I do feel like that along the lines of mobility training ranges of motion that we have, have got to, have got to relate to, to the skill and the demand of, of playing the sport of baseball. So whether it's a hitter or a pitcher, like, we can't just push ranges of motion on guys because that we feel like an increased range or increased levels of mobility or flexibility are important because sometimes guys have too much slack. Uh, They're too lax. Sometimes they have too much slack in their system where actually we actually do the opposite and we're trying to, we're trying to pull some slack out of it through some stability type things and some, um, some, some perturbation drills and interventions where now all of a sudden we're trying to tighten them back up again. So I feel like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with just proceed with caution when it comes to, when it comes to anything where, where their ranges of motion are being tested on a nightly basis and when they need to perform. Now, if, if this were a general population, you know, we're, we're, we just want to feel good. We want to look good. Like maybe the answer is a little bit different. We could probably get away with a little more. However, when, you know, hitting a baseball, a 95 mile an hour fastball. Uh, obviously, there's a there's a time constraint on that, and and sometimes increased ranges that aren't usable, or that we actually give them range and we uh, and we don't teach them how to use it. We can actually do them a performance decrement um, if we're if we're just you know unconsciously cranking different mobility drills or ranges of motion without taking into consideration what exactly is being asked of them. On, on a nightly basis. So I, I, to answer your question more specifically, it, it is very contextual and it's case dependent. And I'd say that, you know, we have the ability to create some change, literally the, the matter of minutes in, in the weight room, for example. However, the key is like, one, make sure that it's indicated that we actually need to do that. And secondly, if it is indicated and we need to do that, then how are we going to teach this individual to actively control through the range of motion that we've increased or that we've given them uh, to make sure that they can stabilize and now move one, number one, at a low velocity and controlled environment in the weight room, in the training room, for example. But then also as we move out into their performance environment out onto the field, now there's an extra stimuli and such. How do they control and own this range of motion at higher velocities when maybe some of their unconscious being starts to take over more often and they, they lose kind of sight or thought of what exactly is being asked of them? are we now putting them in a position to be successful? So I, I'd say that we can create change uh, pretty quickly um, with, with the skill set that, that each of us have and some of the knowledge and, and some of our you know, interventions and writing up our programs. However, the key is making sure that that's 
appropriate, then also if we do give or take away ranges of motion, how can we teach them to operate and what their new what their new state of being is? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I kind of knew that the answer was going to be individualized a little bit. I think it's good to hear that it can happen quick. I think it's also good to hear it can be overdone as well. I mean, I talked about that with Derek in my last episode a little bit, how you can overtrain. And, you know, there's a time when you just got to be cautious with different things, depending on what your outcomes are. But yeah, it's it's good to know that it's going to vary a little bit, uh, but it, you know, it can't subtle changes can make you know pretty quick responses as well. I think it's a positive thing for people to hear, and I do think it, it's you know your plan is probably different for every single person there. I mean, I think of mobility training and range of motions. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about myself. Like this has probably got to be different for you, depending on maybe just the age of different players and people, and you know, as athletic careers continue, right. Does mobility change in training and programs also change over time? I mean, I'm sitting there thinking like, you know, my range of motion now and things I would work on now is, you know, pushing 40 would be different than I was a high school athlete. And you got players, you know, that that come through that are 18 and maybe some that are 28. I I would imagine, you know, as mobility programs training change for each of those people as they change over time, as mobility just as a whole changes as a human. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I'd say that that's part of, what makes our job unique and challenging, but also very um, fulfilling is you're right. We, we see, we, we have, I mean, I would say the age, the age range of players that in my six years to this point that I've, that I've been fortunate enough to coach, I've, I've, I mean, we're talking 16 to upwards of 40. Um, So obviously, you know, at some point in time, (laughs) there's training age, there's chronological age, there's different things to take into consideration. There's also individual characteristics within each of these categories too. Like obviously not every, not every 24 year old collegiate right-handed pitcher is going to show up the same, you know, like each, each guy has kind of um, their own individual nuanced uh, state of being and behavior that kind of probably makes them effective at, at whatever their job is and, and you know in our environment if it's a pitcher it's a pitcher if it's a uh, an elite defender at shortstop it's an elite defender at shortstop if it's a hitter that you know hits for power like obviously most guys are here because they do at least one thing very well and a lot of them do many things very well and and the last thing that we would want to do is take that characteristic or that asset away from them um, which obviously that you know it's, that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier when I when I was talking perceived with caution um, but yes, things change as you age, um, and and certainly how we uh, approach any type of training. Mobility training is no no different. Uh, of our detrained or untrained, I should say, uh, 16, 18 year old Latin American kid is going to be very different than how we approach our you know 33 year old veteran who who probably has a pretty decent feel as to what he needs and how his body shows up daily. And, you know, is this your second year in baseball or is this your 12th year in baseball? Like those two people need two different things. And, and uh, I think that that's kind of what makes our job um, just challenging in general is doing our best to, to meet each guy where they are and really determine through some of our tests and retest and through conversation and really seeking to understand where they are. Like, what is it that each guy needs and how are we going to do everything that we can do on a daily basis to get them as close to that desired outcome at goal as possible and i think that that's kind of the challenge and unfortunately that takes some time to to like kind of establish and get to how can we do that most effectively on a nightly basis because if not we're not doing our job of helping each individual i'll say yeah i, I assumed that it had to be different because i was sitting here listening to you talk and i'm like I, i'm quite sure there were things i could do at 15 that i can't do now now i have i haven't been training with you so that probably is part of the problem right but uh different stages of life <laughs> probably comes with different, you know, mobilities, which probably has to come with different programs to go alongside it. And I wanted to kind of make sure that, that people know that where you are makes a difference as well into what kind of plans you put together, which kind of ties me to, you know, one of my last few questions here is because I want to, we're, we're talking a lot about baseball, which makes sense. That's the space that you're in, but also we're going to have a lot of people listening to the, this, that maybe don't play that sport or aren't, you know, particularly into, you know, competitive athletics as a whole, but just general well-being and maybe just their own personal mobility. Like, do you have any advice for them? So just your everyday person, athlete sitting at home, doesn't have a, access to a, a MLB, minor league baseball facility. Any examples of exercises that even I could just do that could recommend, that could, you know, improve my mobility at home and whatever I'm trying to do with that? 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think that's a, that's always the challenge. Is you, I, I'm obviously biased in the sense that I'm I'm working in this environment and this is what I've known for the last you know the better part of six six years. So I think trying to connect the dots and make my knowledge and my experience on this applicable to whomever is kind of the challenge, right? But that's also what I was just speaking to with what we have to do with our players on a daily basis. So I I think if we're talking to to anyone with maybe limited uh, access to resources, limited exposure to uh, a weight room and such, like the, the good news here is uh, unlike strength training, you don't necessarily have to have access to a weight room or access to any type of equipment to uh, put yourself in a good position from a, from a health standpoint, right? To make sure that you're waking up each morning feeling a little bit better than you did the night before necessarily or uh, putting you in a good spot to, to go out and perform. Some people's performance environment is going out for a daily walk. Some people's performance environment is going on a run. Some people's is weightlifting recreationally. So I, I think understanding that we're all in different spots and different spaces is probably super important uh, just to, to provide some, uh, some advice here. So I, I think just in a general sense, if we start with the midsection, the core, and work our way out, that's going to be a good place to start. Um, I found that, you know, we, we work a lot with, uh, like the pelvis and the rib cage and we work on hip mobility and we're working on T-spine mobility and we're working on, uh, parts of, of our midsection. And now all of a sudden some of our more distal areas, some of our ankles, our shoulders, our wrists, our hands, uh, some of those things tend to, uh, unlock as well, if that makes sense. So I think if we start more centrally located, we start proximal, we start in the midsection, um, uh, with hip. Hit different hip mobility drills, different T-spine mo- mobility drills. Maybe we implement a good quality core program. Now, all of a sudden, this this proximal stability that we've created will unlock some of our uh, more distal issues as, as we kind of go. So, and I'll give you a quick example of myself. So, I, I have pretty poor um, ankle ranges of motion. We're, we're talking in, in all planes. So, ankle... <laughs> ankle dorsiflexion, but I'm also a poor inverter, everter. Like my ankles just don't work very well. Um, however, when I, when I sit down and I work some posterior tilting of the pelvis, when I work on some active internal, external rotation drills, whether that's a seated 90-90, hip capsule, posterior hip capsule, pigeon stretch, uh, things of that nature, and I start to implement those as part of my warm-up routine on a daily basis, now, all of a sudden, I stand up, I squat, I test, retest. Maybe I like video myself doing it to make sure that, uh, that the quality, that the standard is met. Like now, all of a sudden, I found that when I'm asking my body to perform in whatever that environment may be, that kind of setting the stage on the front end through some smart uh, drill work can kind of be the key there. And, and I can provide resources um, to whomever um, to help anyone along in their journey. Uh, all you got to do is reach out. I'll provide you know my contact information, or maybe you can do that in the, in the notes or or whatever. And I actually yeah. have um, some mobility some mobility training examples on on my social media that's kind of laid out. And I, I run through like a, a core one, a T spine one, uh, a uh, a hip mobility one. So there's there's definitely uh, access to resources available um, upon request. And I, I know that it's difficult. Sometimes the answer is where do I start or where do I begin. Um, especially if this type of things piques your interest. Yeah, that's great. That's really nice of you. I, I will put that in the notes. I'll I'll put your contact information and I'll put the handles for your social media so people can go on to check that out because I do think there'll be people that listen to this and are curious about it, right? Because uh, probably not a ton of people tuning in play, you know, professional level sports or, or that high level, but I think mobility training can can be useful for everybody regardless of of what you do, what level, if you're competing or not. Like it's just one of those useful life skills i imagine so i'll put that in there and thanks for offering that and while i'm while we're kind of talking advice w- one last advice question i have for you because i'm sitting here thinking about mobility training as a whole and the exercises that you can do and i'm thinking there's there's probably more that can also help here right like it can't it can't just be all right do these exercises you'll get this result there's got to be a couple other things that you could do and this ties back to what you do when we were talking about just performance as a whole there's a lot that goes to it are there things that also are in the mix here? I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like, are there things I can work into my diet that can help me with my mobility? How much does rest and sleep play into what I'm trying to accomplish here? Do those kind of things become just as crucial as the exercises themselves? Critical. Absolutely critical. I think we, I mean, we've got to set the stage with, with quality sleep, hydration, nutrition, 
Uh, those are really kind of our non-negotiables of things that look, we just, we just got to find a way to make those a priority. Um, we're all guilty of poor everything. <laughs> like I, yeah. you know, stay up too late, get up too early. I don't prioritize it in that way. I don't drink enough water, like, or, you know, there's nothing available. So I'm going to walk to Chick-fil-A or cook out or in and out or what we, you know, wherever you live and whatever is the most convenient option there. I mean, I, we're all guilty of that. However, I, I do feel like a lot of the times, a lot of our focus goes towards um, all of the smart inter ways that we can intervene and all of these different things that we can, that we feel like we can do to, to both optimize health and performance. However, we're not doing a, 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 a solid foundational job of, of sleep, hydration, and nutrition. Uh, it, it would be like constructing a house on a, on a poor foundation, on a crown day, on a foundation that's cracked and and just kind of eroding away. It just wouldn't be a smart move. So I, I think that um, above all else, like we, we all need to do a good job of prioritizing, prioritizing some of those non-negotiables of the sleep, hydration, and nutrition. Again, there, there are resources that are plentiful and, and, and um, in that area I can provide as well if needed. But I, I do feel like that, that all things are tied in together. And I feel like the, the consistency is key here just with anything. And it doesn't, that doesn't mean perfection. It just means that whatever it is that we decide is important for us and our being, or, or if we're a coach and we have influence over other people, uh, whatever we decide is important for us to preach the message that we want to get across to our, you know, our players or our other coaches or our athletes, whatever those things are like consistency wins for sure. It, it means that one on a daily basis, we, maybe it means that we do less. Um, we just do it more often a good example I give with our players here uh, with the White Sox is uh, our stretch time. So our warm up time, our on the field stretch, we have a 10 minute window um, daily. We have a six game series with Mondays off right now and, and the player development model. Guess what? That's an hour of usable time every week that some, sometimes guys just kind of uh, go through the motions. Like we, we've literally at the end of the week, maybe potentially wasted an hour of, of time that we could have used to develop and grow and and do something that's smart and getting them closer towards whatever their goal is as players or whatever our goals are as an organization. And that's just a 10 minute window. Think about what a 10 minute window on a, on a weekly basis could do for a lot of people at 70 minutes. Um, it doesn't seem like much, but I think I, I do think that consistency wins more often than not, especially if you have a quality routine that is repeatable and that can be done at a high level um, on a daily basis, or at least a few times a week, that's really going to kind of put you ahead of the curve um, and towards meeting whatever goals you have for yourself, whether it's related to mobility or just overall um, health and performance, whatever that means to you in your place. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into the picture. And actually, before I elaborate on that, because uh, you brought up cookout and people on this podcast are gonna, that don't live in the Carolinas are going to be like, what in the world are you talking about, Logan? Now, I've lived here for a long time. <laughs> I'm very aware. If you don't know what that is, it is a place where you can get way too much fried food for about three ninety nine. It's a it's a dangerous place. I don't often recommend it, but they do have delicious milkshakes. So I just had to clear that up for anybody that is hanging out That's with right. us at this point. But yeah, there's so much that goes into it. You know, when, I, when we do our presentations, people are like, "Oh, I'm struggling to get to this goal or that goal," and I always ask them like, "What are you eating during the day?" Because they're usually underfueled. And I'm like, "What time did you go to bed?" It's usually two a.m. And it's like without those initial buy-ins on some of that like it's just going to be hard to improve your mobility or any physical goal that you're talking about and so sometimes you know when people, all that isn't tied together you know that can lead to you know them looking for answers in other ways which is really my last big question for you because i want to tie together what you do and what pbs ccs does and what our foundation does because if you don't kind of tie in everything that logan's talking about here today you might try to look for an answer you know through a shortcut right and you may have run into someone in your athletic career that was tempted to use PEDs to achieve, I mean, not even just mobility goals, but physical goals, you know, whatever those look like. And so give us your thoughts on that, right? So for anybody that's listening that's kind of considering that as an option, as, as a quick fix and a shortcut, what's thing? What's the one piece of advice and thing you want to leave them with? Yeah, no, that's a good question. It's very important to, to tie the ends together and to make sense of all of this uh, information in a short period of time too. So I, I would say uh, most importantly, there are, especially today, so many avenues for anyone to achieve whatever desired outcomes they have for themselves through the resources that we have available. In my opinion, there's, there's more uh, now than ever 
resources available for people to uh, educational content um, and, and, and other useful ways to basically leverage this information that we have to do things in a natural manner. There's no um, excuse or reason for people to to try to take a shortcut, especially with the, the information that we have available now and things that can that can be helpful. Like there's more out there now than ever before. However, what comes along with that is unfortunately there there are uh, there is a lot of poor information out there too. And there are a lot of ways and, and such that people do look to make a shortcut. And and I would just say if you're in that space, seek help and seek to understand maybe what are some different ways that you can put yourself at the forefront and get ahead of whatever it is that you're going through in an effort to make sure that um, you're giving yourself the best chance from a health standpoint to stay healthy, but then perform optimally as well, given all of the resources that we have available now. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, right? Like the basically the the answers are out there the the work the whatever you are trying to accomplish can be done and there are people and resources and information out there to help get it done it's going to be harder it's going to take more time but it's going to be way more rewarding in the long run so i think it's a nice way to kind of tie this all together and that was my last big question for you actually before because i've had you for a while i, I do want to let you go but i, I got to ask you two real fast quick hitter questions that i didn't send you but I, what i'm doing is i'm asking all of you that i'm interviewing in this series the same two final questions because I want to see how much you overlap. All right. So I got a couple real fast. Nah. Ones for you. Here, here's your first one. Perfect. So let's say I'm at home. I want to build out a home gym, right? I got whatever my physical goals are. It doesn't really matter, but let's say I've only got the budget to buy one piece of equipment. That's it. I got a, I got to train with just one thing, which is hard to do. But if it's you going to the store, what's that one piece of equipment going to be that you're going to going to start the gym out with? Do we, can we count a barbell and weights as one piece, or is that two pieces? I think so. I mean, I, I, I guess I'll let you slide on that. I mean, because once you go down that path, it's like, well, how many weights are you buying? Are we buying a whole a whole rack, a whole set here? But, you know, I guess, Fair. how about this? I'll let you buy, like, the little adjustable, like, dumbbells that you can all are technically one piece, but you can flip them around. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm in on that. What I was thinking with the barbell here is, like, we, we go, like, a little bit of a landmine attachment. And now all of a sudden we can squat, we can lunge, we can hinge, we can pull, we can press all that with a landmine, with a barbell in the landmine and probably just uh, maybe one or two 45s. Okay. However, however, if, there, if we're literally talking one piece of equipment there, there's no doubt about it. We're going a power block, either, either the dumbbell power blocks that range from like five pounds up to 95, or we're going the, uh, the power block kettlebell that also can range uh, from anywhere from like 10 to 80 or 90 pounds. So that way we have a versatile piece of equipment that can be used for in, in any kind of movement pattern for any kind of drill. Um, but it's, you know, we can take it up one with each hand and all of a sudden we're good to go. We can it's, travel with it too. Yeah. Yeah. Time. It's funny you say that I'm going to count that as your answer because uh, I talked to Derek yesterday. His answer was power blocks. That was his, his response. So I'm going to count that for you where, so we're going to count it two for two, right? That's, uh, in, out there in the mix. <laughs> it might be, might be a good place for people to start. And then the second question, we'll see if you overlap here. It's probably going to be totally dependent on where you've been, but since, uh, you're in the world of baseball and that's really where a lot of this is tying back to, I'm curious. What's the uh, favorite stadium that you've ever been in? And this doesn't have to be Major League Baseball. This could be, you know, minor league stadium. This could be a collegiate stadium, international. It doesn't matter. But is there something that sticks out in your mind? Like, oh, man, this was one of my favorite spots that I've been in. Mm. No, that's a tough one for me. Can I go? Let me think. Can I go one big league and one minor league? Uh, well, I'll put them in separate categories. But, yeah, we can do that. All right. Sorry, I'm being difficult. <laughs> I would works. say... I would say... Oracle Park in San Francisco, beautiful big league one. Yep. And and then I would say I'm biased here, but I think Charlotte's pretty. <laughs> Charlotte's a pretty nice minor league. Yeah, league. yeah. You're playing to your I audience. Mean, I'm, here, bi I'm biased, but <laughs> 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 that's okay. I, I look. There's too many to choose from. Like I, Major League Baseball has done a phenomenal job, uh, especially now, like with their their oversight of minor league baseball, like the facilities for the most part in minor league baseball and player development are, are top notch. We have everything that we could have ever uh, wanted and the resources now are more plentiful than they, than they've ever been. And I know that it will continue to move in that direction as well. So yeah, no, um, sure. I've been fortunate. The night stadium is great. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, the, the skyline background, it is, even though I live here, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think you're biased. It, it is. I've been to a lot of minor league stadiums. It's a, it's a good one. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely it's def- Charlotte's definitely a big league city. So yeah, yeah, and Oracle's great. It's funny that you said that because uh, Oracle is my second favorite major league stadium. And when I asked Derek this question, he told me PNC, which is actually my favorite big big league stadium in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you've been to that one. Um, I have. Okay, yeah. I, have, I almost I almost I almost said that one. Yeah, it I I think just the walking across the bridge and the view and all that it's it's up there but Oracle is for me a very close second. So we're we're all pretty much in the same ballpark, right? So uh, fun fun to see how that overlaps. It has nothing to do with mobility training, but uh, I think a fun place for us to wrap this thing up. But I mean, even beyond those couple quick things, man, I I, I want to end this by thanking you. You know, not not only for the time but for the information and also your willingness to keep getting that information out there and helping people. Cause I think this is something that can help people w- in their athletic career, whatever that looks like in whatever the space that is, you know, appreciate the information and the great work that you're doing. Keep it up. Thanks for the time. And I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely, man. One, one parting thought here is just for anyone listening. Like, I think the biggest thing with, with all of these things, no matter what it is in life, I think that you got to believe in yourself and uh, it, there's no harm, no foul in seeking help when you need it. Um, that's I think we're all in a different spot and we show up in different places and and ultimately end of the day we're all kind of rowing the boat in the same direction so the more that we can continue to help one another and uplift one another um, in whatever avenue whatever means possible like just know that that's that's the space that I'm coming from and I feel like that that I've been so fortunate to be exposed to others that that have helped me along in my journey um, as well so I have uh, a great deal of respect for all those individuals and the, and the least that I can do is continue to pay it forward and in this way so thanks so much for asking me on this morning and and uh hope that hopefully in a digestible way in such a short period of time we can provide something to someone that can help and assist them along in their journey so thanks so much man i appreciate your time absolutely i don't doubt it at all this is definitely helpful information and i'm with you it's a great party message we're all humans we're all living on the same earth we're all more way more similar than we are different right so thanks for your willingness to put this out there and to keep it going uh, we'll keep the conversation going as much as we can on our end and keep doing the great work and We will do it again soon. Thanks so much, Logan. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it, man. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.